is gonna love this. Let me see here. Hello there. It would appear that the 172 project is finally coming to a end. So what does this mean? I'm gonna get the cowling off. I'm going to pull the plugs out and try to get it battery charge and get it primed for oil. I've got some small loose ends and things to tie up there, but I am probably just a day or two away from being completely finished with this aircraft outside of the logbooks. So stick around and I'll find a topic to get into. So what I would like to talk to you all about today is the importance of engine break-in. Now, I do apologize. It has not been windy all morning. I've been doing lots of little work and people have been asking me questions, so I haven't had a chance to pull the camera out. And I'm just now pulling the camera out, but I promise you haven't missed anything. So what is engine break-in and why is it important is my first question. Well, when an engine is brand new, it has to wear, if you will. All of the metal parts are still brand new. Everything hasn't had a chance to uh, get scuffed, if you will. And during the break-in period, all of the parts in the engine are wearing into one another. The crankshaft is wearing into the into the ring, or not the rings, the crankshaft is wearing into its bearings, the piston rings are wearing into the cylinders, and everything is forming the, uh, the seals and whatnot that it will have for the next 2,000 hours of operation, or whatever TBO may be. So why is aircraft engine break-in so important, and what mistakes are often made? Well, I'm gonna talk about first what how you should do it, and then I'm gonna talk about how some people say you should do it, what the difference is, and what I think you should do with your engine. So what is my advice to you for engine break-in procedures? Well, spoiler alert for this video, I'm going to tell you to follow your manufacturer's recommendations, but I am gonna talk about some common misconceptions and some things that people do. So typically, the manufacturer, for example, Continental, and I'll see if I can link their document down below because this is a Continental engine. Continental will tell you to run the engine on the ground one time to do a uh, preliminary heat cycle, if you will, which the people who overhauled this engine already did. But since it's been sitting for so long, I'm going to do it one more time. After that preliminary engine run, though, Continental and most people will all tell you the same thing. So this is not so much a myth, this is just something that's known, is that for the first flight, you should not do an engine run-up. So for those of you who watch the channel who aren't familiar with an engine run-up, all that means is when you get to the end of the runway before takeoff, you put the engine at 1,700 RPMs and you check the operation of both the left and right mag, and then you you check the carb heat. If it has a propeller, you cycle the propeller a couple of times. You check all your engine temperatures and that everything is working properly and you take off. Well, for your first flight, you do not want to do an engine run up. We interrupt your regularly scheduled video to see if we can get oil pressure on this thing for the first time. So there's my oil pressure gauge. Now that does lead me to my next point in the video, which is that you want to make sure you're doing two things. You want to make sure that your engine oil system is primed. That's why I pulled all the plugs out and I cranked it over for a couple of minutes. It's to build oil pressure and here in a few minutes I will crank it over again without the plugs in it to build some oil pressure and push some oil through the system. Especially on an engine like this which has been sitting for a few weeks, it's a good idea to make sure that you have good oil pressure and oil throughout the entire engine before you do any sort of preliminary runs on it. Now, you do also want to be using mineral oil. You should not be using any sort of synthetic oil. You should not be using any sort of additives unless they're required by an AD, like CamGuard for some of your Lycoming uh, O320H like H models, for example. Um, so you don't want to be using any sort of synthetics, any sort of additives, and you want to use straight mineral oil. More on straight mineral oil in just a second. So why does one use mineral oil? Well, straight mineral oil without any ashless dispersant allows any sort of metal particulates and um, abrasion, if you will, to clump into large pieces. If you think of building a sand castle, for example, if it's wet, the sand will clump together and when it's dry, it's obviously a powder. This clumping allows any sort of metal particulates and things to get collected in the oil filter and changed at the first oil change after about 10 to 15 hours of flight. 
everyone agrees on this. So where do people start to disagree? The first flight. Well, like I said earlier, most people understand and know not to do an engine run-up. Don't get me wrong, you can check the mags by quickly flipping one off and flipping the other off while you're taxiing. So, truthfully, takeoff is really where our first disagreement comes in. And that is, some people and some guys believe that you should take off at a low power setting as minimal as possible. Other people believe that you should take off at full power and not baby the engine. Here's my opinion, and like I said earlier, spoiler alert, spoiler alert, you should be following the manufacturer's recommendations. Or, in the case of this engine, if it was overhauled by a specific facility, you should follow whatever recommendations they tell you to follow. If they tell you to follow Continentals, which they probably will, then you should follow those. And if anything happens or goes wrong, you have some recourse to get your money back. But the issue is really this. If you take off and fly at a low power setting and baby the engine, it's not good for it. And the reason that isn't good for it is because there's not enough temperature and there's not enough heat and there's not enough pressure to get things to seat properly and wear properly inside the cylinders. Vice versa, if you take off and you fly at full power and just rag on it, there might be a little bit too much heat and too much pressure before things have had a chance to uh, wear in where they would like to and you could cause it to wear even faster than it's supposed to. And I, I don't remember the number off the top of my head, but like I said, I'll, I'll put Continental's data there. But Continental, I believe, says 75 or 85% power um, for the first flight. Which then leads me to my next point. Once you get it in the air, you really want to fly at various power settings, angles of attack, and altitude for durations no longer than about 10 minutes. I'd actually say five minutes. If you take off and you fly, you know, you take off and you go up to your, your cruise altitude and you set the power and you fly all the way to wherever it is you're going at that power setting and then land, that's not good for the engine either because things are going to wear into that RPM range. Instead, what you want to do is you want to take off, adjust your power settings and your climb rate as you climb, and then once you get at altitude, you want to adjust your power settings and cruise settings at altitude so that the engine is not staying in one RPM range for the duration of the entire flight. Even after that first flight, which Continental has a recommendation on duration, I still don't personally think it's a good idea to start beating on the engine real hard, right? I think it's a better idea and a better practice to continue flying the aircraft for long durations i.e. an airplane like this, which is a trainer aircraft, will not be used for any sort of flight instruction for about the first 10 to 15 hours, at least until the first oil change. Now, after your first and second oil change, after oil consumption and metals in the oil have been stabilized, then you can start using an airplane like this for flight instruction. For about the first 10 to 15 hours though, it's critical that what the aircraft does is long duration cross countries varying the power settings throughout, which again is following the manufacturer's recommendations. I realize this may have been a boring video, but I do appreciate you for watching. As always, like, comment, subscribe, and be easy. But wait, there's more. I'm gonna go see if I can take this thing over to the fuel farm, or the fuel pump, I should say, and um, put some gas in it. But before I do that, I'm gonna go ahead and make another video because I'm not gonna be out here at the airport for a few weeks. So I'm gonna go ahead and make another video talking about some of my other opinions on longevity of engines while I continue to put this airplane back together because it is almost done. All right, well, there's that. I've got the tail strapped. I'm gonna go ahead and get this thing in this thing and I'm gonna try to fire it up for the first time. Oh, pressure's good, RPMs are up. Oh, I know the owner is gonna love this. Let me see here. Man, this thing is running smooth, so I'm gonna keep an eye on the temperatures and the, and the pressures, and as soon as everything gets nice and warm, I'll shut it back off, and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna call it for the day. I'll probably come back out here tonight and put the end number on it, finish it up completely. I can't believe this project is done. That, that's insane. Seven months. Thanks for watching.